And then in our lessons this morning, we are, Jesus talks about salt. And so, just a couple of observations on, on the salt to get us ready for, to listen to Jesus' strange explanation to his disciples. There are two peanuts walking down the road. One was assaulted. Um, someone once said I looked like a salt shaker. I took that as a condiment. Yeah, okay, well. And you know why seals don't live in why, why why seals live in salt water? Because pepper makes them sneeze. Someone threw a sodium compound at me. I took it as an assault. Yes. Um, and here's your question of the day. What do you call it when the salt says hello to the pepper? Season's greetings. <laughs> yeah, that's... Okay. Well, maybe may a little early for that one, but, you know, nonetheless. Um, but in our lessons, Jesus does talk about salt. And his explanation to his disciples on what's going on is a little bit difficult to follow. So, let us begin with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, Empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The first reading is from Numbers 11, 4 through 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the lemons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight? that you may lay the burden of all this people on me. Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their plate there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and told some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one day named Aldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, and Josiah, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people's, Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Word of God, word of life. The psalm is Psalm 19, 7 through 14. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired and more than much fine gold sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. But them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. The words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The second reading is from James 5, 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are they cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, 
and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel from Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose a reward. If any one of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand caused you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I love those words from Jesus. Have salt in yourselves. He never heard those words coming from a doctor about a low-sodium diet. Have salt in yourself. Every time this text comes up and Jesus talks about salt, I'm reminded of um, a fellow Minnesotan, um, Garrison Keeler, uh, author of Lake Wobegon, who talks about his distant relatives, the Krebsbach family. They were distant not only in in, in blood relation, but also in the, how the rest of the family treated them. They were very distant. It reflects on the Krebsbach part of the family because they were the part of the family that, well, they never seemed to be able to do anything right. Um, they had old refrigerators littering their yards. And they were a fam- part of the family that, that had no manners. They rode around in pickup trucks with their shirts off, and they talked loud. And they just didn't seem to have any sense of what was proper in life. They even drank beer in their front yards. Ah, yeah. And Garrison reflects on on that part of the family, and he laments how badly, badly they were treated and made not to feel welcome just because they were different. And he he laments um, not getting to know them better 
Because in all this reflection and, and lamentation, he said the one thing he really misses about them was the salt that they added to life. But they were shunned away, so to speak, because they were different. Well, in our first lesson, we know something about being different. And the characters are Eldad and Medad. They're just fun names to say, Eldad and Medad. Our first lesson comes from the book of Numbers. And here's a little trivia for you. You can work in a conversation sometime this week. Um, the book of Numbers. Why is it called the book of Numbers? Because somewhere along the line, somebody noticed at the beginning of this book, there's a census where they counted people, numbers. And at the end, there's another census where they counted people. And so they call it the book of numbers. That's what we know it as in our Old Testament. In the Hebrew Bible, it's not known by the name of numbers, but rather in the wilderness. Because in between those two census takings is the story of God's people wandering through the wilderness for those 40 years. Work that into a conversation this week. But in our first lesson, it all begins with some whining. Now that, well, that we can be familiar with. But God's people are whining, and they come to whining to Moses because they don't have any meat to eat. And then their distorted kind of memory of the good old days, you know. Back when we were in Egypt, we had all this food to eat, all this wonderful food and, and garlic and vegetables and all these things to eat. But here, all we have is this lousy manna. They forgot that they were slaves at the time, too. But at the moment, that's all they whined about was they had no meat to eat. And they whined to Moses. And they must have done this quite a bit, and a lot of people must have done it, and uh, with some, some sense of, of vigor, because um, Moses then in turn whines to God. And the first thing he, he whines to God about is not the meat, but he whines, God, how do you expect me to do this? You know, it, this is just too much for me. All these people whining, all these people complaining, how am I going to find meat for them to eat? And he whines about just how terrible it is that he has to do all of this. And I'm sure it's overwhelming. So God does respond. God will eventually respond to the, to the initial whining about, from the people about the meat to eat. But that's beyond our text. And, and, and check it out sometime. It's an interesting story what God does but, uh, to provide that meat. But instead, God specifically addresses in our text uh, Moses and his whining about it, it being overwhelming. And he says, okay, choose 70 leaders, 70 elders among all the people, and I will appoint them to be your helpers in all of this. And so Moses does. He chooses 70 of the elders, and he brings them down to the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is simply the place where God and Moses communicate. And Moses takes those who are gathered, lines them up in the tent, and God appears and takes some of the spirit of Moses and places it upon those 70 who were chosen. And immediately they began to prophesy. And it's clear they only did it once. But maybe that was a confirmation of the fact that they had been chosen and ordained, as, as it were, by God. Meanwhile, back at the camp, where everybody else was, two who were among the 70, for some reason, did not go down to the tent of meeting. We don't know why. But when the Spirit fell upon those who had gathered at the tent of meeting, it also fell upon them because they were among those who were chosen. And they began to prophesy right in the camp. And again, they prophesied once and that was it. But then, when it was all over, someone comes running up to Moses and said, Moses, Moses, Eldad and Medad prophesied in the camp. And Joshua, the, who was second in command, said, Moses, my Lord, must forbid that. 
I can only imagine the look on Moses' face and said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, he said, oh, that all of God's people would be prophets and God's spirit would fall upon them. Moses wasn't upset that they were different, that they didn't come down to the tent of meeting like they were instructed to. But just the fact that God's spirit was on them was good enough. The differentness didn't matter to him. Oh. We find something similar happening in our gospel lesson. John comes up to Jesus and said, Jesus, you know, we ran across some guy, and he was casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. We tried to put an end to it because he wasn't following us. And I can only imagine that Jesus must have had the same look that Moses had on his face when he learned the news. And Jesus said, don't forbid them. And then he gets into this explanation of why. He said, because someone who does something in my name cannot shortly afterwards speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Oh. And then this, this cryptic thing. He said, if somebody gives you a cup of cold water or a cup of water because you bear the name of Christ, they don't lose their, their reward. Now, don't take that in, in any works righteousness kind of thing, that somehow if you give a cup of water to someone in the name of Christ, you get a reward. That's not what he's saying. He's talking to those who are receiving and saying, get over it. Just because somebody doesn't meet your expectations, doesn't belong to the same club as you, and they give you something good, don't simply discard it. Oh. Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand that the kingdom of God is about including. Including especially the little ones, the vulnerable ones. The least in their culture. Those who believe in him are not to be excluded just because they're different. Oh. And he tries to emphasize this, the importance of including and welcoming people. And he gets off into this whole thing about cutting off your hand and your foot and plucking out your eye because he considered it a sin to shun people away simply because they are different. Oh. And then he says, you're all going to be salted with fire. There are going to be challenges in life. But have salt in yourselves. Have salt in yourselves. Embrace. Embrace that diversity. Embrace the differentness of all of God's people. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. A prominent theologian uh, not too long ago made the statement that he said, finally we meet one another not in our agreements or disagreements, but rather we meet one another at the foot of the cross, where God is faithful, where Christ is present, and where by the power of the Holy Spirit we are made one in Christ. So Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Be at peace. It doesn't mean quash any disagreements or any arguments, but deal with them. It's okay. We don't all think the same. But he said in the midst of that, recognize the wholeness of the person whom you disagree with, from the person who you differ from. Recognize that they too are a creation of God. That they too belong to God. And treat them with a sense of wholeness, the wholeness that comes with being a creation of God. Treat them with wholeness and recognize that wholeness within them. How intolerant we are sometimes of people who are different, who act differently, 
who have different ways about them. Even in our hymn of the day, Marty Haugen reminds us this morning that we are salt. Salt in the kingdom of God. And that we are to share the flavor. I love that. The flavor of life in the kingdom of God. The flavor of life. The same love and compassion that God has shown to us. That we are to share that as being part of the kingdom of God. This morning, Jesus simply reminds us, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen. <laughs>
Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you turn to those about you and share a sign of peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our calling and our joy, that we should at all times and all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious redemption opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. <coughs> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body and it's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he did, gave it to them saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And sin in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And if you'll take that wafer from the bottom of your chalice. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ, and it's given for you. from the top of the chalice. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ, and it's shed for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood remain with us as we seek to take the message of love and grace into the world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, 
in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.